Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Tonight's uh, lecture will be on uh, a topic that's close to all of our uh, hearts, Jewish mothers. It better be close to your heart. <laughs> Anyways, I find it interesting that the last thing that God made in the order of creation was woman. The question is why. We have a belief that says, Acheron, Acheron, Chaviv, that the best is less for last. So God waited until every living creature was created, and then he made woman. Though woman was last, her origin was higher than any living being. Animals were created as they are today, as living beings. Man, the jewel of creation, was made from the dust of the earth, a lifeless mannequin, and maybe that is the origin of the word mannequin. God blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and then he became a living, breathing entity, the king of the universe. Woman's origin was much higher than anything else that was created. God took a rib from Adam, first man, and with that rib, he created a woman. Her source was not earth, but the highest form of life, man himself. We know that nothing in life is an accident. So why did God choose a rib taken from a man's body to be the material from which he would create a woman? Ribs are made up of cartilage. Cartilage is much softer and more flexible than bone. The function of the ribs is to protect the vital organs of the body. This alludes to the primary purpose of a woman, to be a mother and to provide protection for her family. In order to be successful in her role, she must be flexible. If she is too rigid, she will fail. At the same time, she must be strong enough to endure the pain and hardships that childbirth and motherhood and life can demand of a woman and a mother. A woman is a true lover. Just like the rib cage, she yearns to embrace her husband and her children. At the same time, women are very sensitive and emotional. Again, similar to a rib. If, you have ever, if you've ever cracked a rib, you know there are few injuries that are more painful. There is really no real cure. It just takes time. All you can do is wrap them. Just like a woman, show a little emotion. A hug goes a long way. So too, when one hurts a woman, she feels a pain deeply, and it takes time to heal. God built into creation a natural feeling of motherhood in all living creatures, not just humans. Even animals will do all that they can to protect their young, even to the point of putting their own lives in jeopardy. In nature, it is usually the male of the species that is most attractive, whereas with humans, it's the female, the true jewel of creation. Her beauty allows her to accomplish things that would be much more difficult for a man. She possesses true warmth and emotions. Women have the ability to laugh and to cry. Yet at the same time, they possess amazing strength. Women carry and give birth to children, and sometimes many of them. If men had to go through childbirth, we might have one child, but that would be the end of that. It would be a much less populated world. Women bear the burden of life much better than men. What I find most interesting is that the first commandment that God gave to mankind was peru revu, be fruitful and multiply. You would have thought that this commandment would have been given to a woman, since they are the ones who do all the work and suffer all the pain and discomfort. But no, women do not have this obligation. They do not have a commandment to get married, nor are they commanded to bear children. The commandment is only on a man. Yet women do have children. As I mentioned, some of them even have many children. Some of the women who cannot conceive are truly disappointed. But all this tells us is that a woman, by her very nature, is a true giver. You know, God created this world, we believe, with ten traits that he takes upon himself. Of those ten traits, only one, malchut, kingship, is feminine. A trait that is associated with Dovin King David. This is a trait that is known as a mikabel, 
a receiver. Its purpose is much like a woman who receives a drop of semen from a man and returns a complete adoring child. This is the trait that in the end is connected to Mashiach and Kenu, may come quickly and in our time. Now, the first mother of the Jewish nation was Sarah. She yearned to have a child, and when God blessed her with a son, she did all in her power to nurture and protect him, going so far as to tell her husband Abraham to banish his son Yishmael from their house. She felt that he could be a bad influence on her son Yitzchak, peer pressure, something that we as parents still deal with today. We, when we are young, many times we really don't appreciate its importance, but as adults, we understand it completely. The second mother of the Jewish nation was Rivka. She was willing to put her life on the line for her son Yaakov. When Yitzchak wanted to bless his eldest son Esau, she felt that it was imperative that Yaakov receive that blessing. When she told Yaakov to dress up as Esau so he could receive that blessing instead, he refused. Yaakov was afraid that if his father, who was blind, would realize that he was imitating Esau in order to receive his older brother's blessing, that his father would not bless him but curse him instead. She said to him, Alai uh, Bini, that if your father curses you, then the curse Alai shall fall on me. A Jewish mother sacrificing herself for her child. When she realized that Asa was so angry at Yaakov for taking the blessing, that he wanted to kill him, she told Yitzchak, her husband, to send Yaakov to her brother Lavan so that he could find a wife. She feared for Yaakov's life. And so she sent her favorite son away, knowing that she may never see him again. She should have told Yitzhak to send Esau away, like Sarah did with Yishmael. But she understood that Esau, her other son, needed to be close to his father, or he would be totally lost. Yaakov would be able to survive on his own. She sacrificed herself again for her eldest son, though she had issues with him. Without the righteousness and self-sacrifice of the mothers in Egypt, our nation would not have survived the cruel and torturous slavery. And even if they would have survived, their numbers would have been far smaller if it had been left up to the men alone. We know from the Medrash that Amram, the leader of the generation, and the father of Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, the three shepherds of the Jews in the desert, decided to divorce his righteous wife, Yochebed. He felt it was useless to bear, ch to bear children, only to have them killed and tortured by their Egyptian masters. Many of the men followed his example. His young daughter Miriam told her father that he was even worse than Paro, who had only decreed that the male babies be drowned in the Nile, whereas her father had decided that no children, none, male or female, should be born. Because of his daughter's rebuke, Amram remarried his wife, Yochevet, and Moshe, the redeemer of Israel, was born. Jewish mothers. Hannah waited impatiently for many years, many years, to have a child. She prayed and beseeched God in every way that she could to be blessed with children. When finally God answered her prayers, what did she do? He would have thought that she would have wanted to keep her precious son close to her always. Make him a mama's boy. Her, he, he was, after all, her special diamond. But no. When he was just two years old and weaned, she brought him to Ailey, the high priest, to serve as a Nazarite for, to God for the whole, his whole life. This was Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, who in Psalms, is referred to as even greater than Moshe and Aaron together. Again, we see a Jewish mother being a true giver to her family and to God Almighty himself. Now, there are two other stories that we find in the Torah where mothers did not act with the same compassion, where they may have started with the best of intentions, but were unable to finish well. First is Hagar, Sarah's maidservant. 
Avraham, listening to Sarah's demand, and with God's approval, drove her and Yishmael out of his house with only some bread and water. Yishmael was sick, and he drank up the water very quickly. Hugger felt that he was about to die, and so she placed him under a bush, and she walked a distance away so as not to witness her son's death. This is when an angel talks to her and tells her, Yishmael will live. It says in Vayera 21.17, But Yishmael okem is kol hanar, and God heard the boy weeping. Not her tears or prayers, his. The angel then shows her a well, and there was nothing miraculous about the well that had been there all the time. She just didn't see it. No Jewish mother leaves her child to die alone. She would shake the heavens with her prayers and drown the earth with her tears. A Jewish mother would search high and low and find water. The second example is Potiphar's wife. From the storyline, we know that she constantly tried to seduce Yosef. Rashi in the portion of Vayeshev 39.1 states that the story of Tamar, who seduced Yehuda, her father-in-law, is next to the story of Yosef and Potiphar's wife to tell us that just as the latter acted for the sake of God, so too the former also acted for the sake of God. And since Potiphar's wife saw through her astrologers that she was destined to produce children from Yosef, however, she didn't know whether it would be through herself or through her daughter. Now how was she being a good mother? By trying to seduce Yosef. The astrologer said that either her or her daughter would have a ch a children from Yosef. The astrologer did not tell her that Yosef would be the viceroy of Egypt. She only knew him to be a slave. And even if she would have freed him, he would still have had the blemish of being a slave. Not exactly someone that you want your daughter to marry, especially if your husband was a minister to the king, nobility. So she took the matter into her own hands and decided she could have a child from Yosef and people would assume that her husband was the father. The path to hell is paved with good intentions. In the end, it all became about her and not her daughter. He rejected her, Yosef, and in the end, she tried to have him killed. Again, Jewish mothers are there until the end, whatever it takes. I personally am a child of the Holocaust. My mother lost her whole family, mother, father, seven sisters and brothers. She had no one, no one and nothing. She stepped out of a concentration camp, a young girl, 13 years old, frightened and alone. She married my father at age 13, gave birth to me at age 14. She had two more children before she was 18 and was divorced. Her life was a disaster. She was just a kid, and yet she was already a mother, with no parents to help and guide her. How different her life and ours would have been if she would have been able to have been loved, taught, and protected by her loving parents. She gave us what she could, but it was a case of on-the-job training. She was in a strange country with a strange language, in a totally different culture. But she did instill in us those traits that make us Jewish, those traits that connect us to our grandparents that we never met. We may never have met them, but we did know them and still do today because they were and are the grandchildren of our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This, this last week was my mother's 33rd Yorzeit. I still miss her and think of her daily. I owe her more than I can ever repay. And with all that she couldn't give me, still she gave me one thing that counts the most. Undying and unconditional love. She demanded perfection and dedication. All that I am today is due to the sweat, tears, and prayers of a young, scared, orphan girl who never gave up on me 
and always believed that I would succeed. She was a true Yiddish mama, a true Jewish mother. Thank you for coming. God bless, and Shabbat Shalom.